Uh, okay, a bit of pressure because I've got some of my students here. I say mine, but they're ours. The focus on uh, coming to talk to, to today is to give you a little bit of a background about my personal journey and what I feel and felt. And if you've heard me talk before, sorry, you're going to have some reiteration. Uh, the focus of learning for me is fundamental in how we're going to go forward. And the number of people in this room right now, if you all just accepted one thing, that you were going to motivate yourself to improve 10 other people's lives, we'd have 1,000 people in this area with better lives. So the focus, that, as we quickly start, is going to be talking about learning and the journey of schooling and the awfulness of learning. And the intention is to make it awful. How can we make learning full of awe? Because awe, as psychologists will tell you, leads to reverence and humility. And I think we've lost that sense of humility and our place under others to hold people, to lift people up. Instead, we're seeing the sense of ego controlling and trying to push down. So the first thing is, um, I, I, I've been through the education system. Uh, I, was, I was born in Lismore Base Hospital. I was actually brought home from Lismore Base and uh, I resided in the house that's now my school. Um, I, I, was, I was educated at Lismore Public School and then I went to Lismore High School and then I jumped the fence and went to Southern Cross University. Why? Because I just wanted to have fun and I wanted to surf. And in the process, I, I also learned a lot that school wasn't really about learning, it was more a social event for me. I, I, I learned most of my knowledge and my understanding that shaped me as a person when I left school and when I had to become a teacher. I learned a lot more about the indigenous culture after school than I did in school. And I learned that there were a lot of things that we needed to learn in school, but we weren't. And that led me to a little bit of a journey of discovery. Firstly, you know, what is education? Education comes from this Latin word, ducere, uh, which means to, to lead, to draw out your potential, your latent potential. And, and school actually comes from skull, which means leisure in the pursuit of knowledge. And pedagogy, this word that you'll hear academics talk about all the time, was actually the slave, the pedagogue, who took the wealthy children to Socrates and the tutors. And I started questioning the very intention of school. Because school, it seems to me, has been developing children to have an approach towards a career. It's been developing an understanding of knowledge, that we have a fixed asset that we have to impart, and then we have to test. And we have to find out through recall whether you've learned it. Just see, the intention of school is about me standing here with an understanding, asking you questions, and if you get it right, you're smart. And yet when I interview children, a lot of the time I find they've never been asked the question, are you smart? We don't want to do that. So the first thing I want to do is just acknowledge that we are sitting on this land of the, the Bundjalung Nation. And the Bundjalung Nation was a very large nation of indigenous culture that lasted for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And here we can see Wollumbun and we can see the caldera. Now, I learned about the caldera, but I was never told that the word came from cauldron. And that makes sense. It's not the point in the middle. It's the boundary on the outside. And there are a lot of things I found that actually adults lose understanding, as in which way is this bus going? Is it going to the left or is it going to the right? More children aged five and under get this answer correct than business people when they did the same surveys. And the reason is because you can't see the door. So you know, in Australia, which way would this bus be going? I'll take your word for it. The focus on what we need to understand is that knowledge, when I was uh, developing my understanding, is that th there's this insatiable need to know things, and, and you're never going to know it all. In fact, knowledge is really knowing where the ledge is. I was creating multimedia technology, and all of a sudden, I thought I'd got to a point where I knew it, and I just kept on going and going. I don't know if you've got there yourself, but it's panting time. You sit and you stop. And I know also that the basis of any change in correction and improvement in the world starts with education. So when we hear people saying we've got to make a change, we have to, first of all, look at how we educate. 
And Bruno was doing this, and his whole focus was about building integrated understanding, big picture learning. There are no such subject silos in real life. And the fish will be the last to know they're in the water. You have to jump out of that water and see what is school really doing. And this is an intentional pace where we look at the definition and we find there's some interest in words. Because we've all been educated. Now we've got school that's unschooling, homeschooling, because we're sorry and we're worried about what the system's doing. And the system is a relic. And I've shown this slide a few times, but in this slide, can you tell me which ones are jails and which ones are schools? Can you choose which ones? There's only one jail in this picture, and it's number two. So why do we group children together in masses, put teachers with specialist knowledge inside, tell them the stranger danger on the outside, and make them sit in cells when the world is so expansive? To see, we've been doing it for generations, ever since the Industrial Revolution is where it started. And it was really the public social computer that we were trying to replicate as colonization took the Western world around the world. And even when we got this new great advancement called technology, which I think we've realized after the COVID isn't as good as we thought, we still stuck kids inside a room and had them plug in and listen. And I think there's an interesting element to here because school is, has got a part of our DNA. It's, it's in our background. This school is one of the most famous schools in the world. You wouldn't know it because it just looks like a little school in Indonesia uh, sponsored by Milo. <laughs> and that is actually Barack Obama's primary school. And this school is also one of the most famous, and you might not know this one, except when I show you the seniors' wall with Monopoly, you might know that that's Donald Trump's prep school. And when we start thinking about education and we understand that education, the greatest technology, was by James Pillins from the Scottish era of presentation of ideas to mass populations, we start to see the chalkboard, which became the blackboard, which became the green board because black was too stark a colour. And the question that Jamie McKenzie asks everybody in a room, and I repeat it all the time, is think about your own teachers. How many of your teachers taught you to think, not know information, but actually taught you to think? And if I do this little paper bag survey and I start with nine, put up your hand if you've got nine teachers you're thinking of right now. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and sadly none. The average is three, two to three. That's an indictment, or could it just be a clever trick of Jamie McKenzie because we don't remember all of them all the time at straight that moment. And so we've also had this great push after the Sputnik era where Russia was defeating America in its uh, space race to quickly try and improve standards through testing and standardized tests to see if we can group all our kids together and find out who's smart and who isn't. And we've found that it flatlines. There hasn't been improvement in literacy or numeracy. So what are we doing? You know, I'm not against tests. Personally, I think tests are challenges, and I think some tests are great. These eye tests are fantastic, and I need them. But the problem is that if a test starts driving the process of learning, we're actually looking at the effect, not the cause. And the intentional focus on our prediction of where kids go with our reports that come from our tests can be so awry. This is Winston Churchill's report card when he left prep school. Very naughty. And when we ask parents who have been indoctrinated in the system with the fear of career, we find that in Australia, as in most countries, greater focus on the new type of careers, jobs and skills needed for the future, a more relevant and up-to-date curriculum that keeps pace with changing, greater focus on preparing them to use new and emerging technology. So let's see how you're doing. Are you preparing for 2034? How much are you studying right now to meet the needs of 2034? I mean, are you studying drones 
Are you studying artificial intelligence? Are you studying electric vehicles? Are you making every day where you've got to learn more literacy around the financial implications of Bitcoin? Because that's a kindergarten's child travel through school to where they're going to leave in year 12, as of today. So maybe there's a little bit more to schools than we think. You know, when we look at the comparison of standardized tests to innovation, we can see the death of entrepreneurs as a result. And isn't hope entrepreneurship? Is education and teaching something that we have an outcome for, a product? Or is it actually a learning event? To see that the great intention of, of education has always been this ponderance. Is it a vessel to be filled or a fire to be kindled? But they still miss it because they think it's an individual element. It isn't, it's social. You coming in together and listening to me is a social event. And this is really fundamental because we've got so much knowledge in a network that we shouldn't be teaching about the individual achievement and what they're doing, their grades better than others. What we should be doing is saying, how can we all collaborate? But when we ask kids about school, these are the common answers to get a good job. And then we find that around the world you can do these, Gallup polls have done them time and time again, and that the biggest problem we've got is disengagement. Over 50% of our kids sitting in schools are disengaged. They don't like school. And I think if you ask teachers teaching under the burden of some of the, the bureaucratic responsibilities and requirements now, you'll find them tethered to a post feeling that they don't like teaching. If you don't like something, how can you possibly, possibly, initiate a love of learning for life. But it's not engagement. It's actually agency. Just see, if it's, if it's engagement, we're continually trying to do things to make kids feel better. We'll put more technology in. We're going to do more things for them. But we ask kids, and I ask kids this all the time, what do you want to learn? They don't know. They say, I don't know. When I started a school and I asked them that, that was the most obvious statement that came forth. When I said, and I spoke to Parsi Solberg, and he said, you're asking the wrong question. You've got to ask them, what do they want to do? And I thought, okay, we asked them, what do they want to do? And we've had answers. But that really has an implication that kids don't understand the definition of learning. They don't understand what it means to learn. And this is the fundamental piece that all schools should do. We should be turning kids' interest into passions. And we can't do that with sameness. We can't do that with standardized approaches. But I, I want to ponder this one question, what is the greatest threat to our future? And I'd love a little forum. What is our greatest threat? Some would say climate change. Some would say pollution, disease. What do you think is the greatest threat to our population in the future? Population? Overexplosion? Disconnection. Disconnection. Anything else? Inaction. And I think that's it. I think the real truth is it's apathy. We've got the most potential because we've got people. We have to increase conscious awareness of our potential to do good. We have to understand that learning must be life worthy. If we're teaching kids anything, it must be that they have a life that's worth living. And that's the problem. As David Lynch would say, we need to expand their consciousness. And if we don't do that, we're not serving and understanding. And consciousness is not inside a classroom. It's not inside a campus. It's not inside a textbook. Consciousness is a relationship with people and with the local area and the wider world. How can we possibly understand the scope of this globe if we don't know the rivers of our local area? The flow. How can we challenge kids to go further if they don't even know what challenge is? How can we say that challenge is busting through the walls and motivate kids to find their envelope and break it when really it's an emotional journey of not breaking it, of having regret and having the drive to try again? Just see, the focus on everything is about the narrative of who we are as people. 
And in this picture you see, as I've shown you before, some of you, you see a family sitting on a beach at Lennox Head. You can notice that there's a lot of kelp on this beach, which we don't see anymore. You can notice there are no houses on the points escarpment. You can notice it now has trees. We've actually reforested the point. But what you haven't noticed, and your whole emotional state will change, is when I tell you that's a photo of me. In the tummy of mum on the day I was born. And the feeling of connection changes as a result. To see, we are not just brains on sticks. We are people evolving and developing. And every one of us has a mind. In awe, we must ensure there's reverence. Respect comes from this understanding that we are just these little creatures who need to support each other. We talk about empathy and resilience. We talk about all these elements of fundamental emotional states but at the end, it comes down to one thing, a sense of reverence, because if we know our smallness in the universe, we'll start to find humility within each other. Thank you.